Hello, everybody. Dr. Ben Edwards here. Welcome to another episode of You're the Cure. Got a great show today. We're going to be talking about kids and the education system and brain development and kids that are getting kind of slaughtered a little bit. Um, just before we hit record, Dr. Steve Ingersoll, who's our guest today, I'll bring Steve on here in just a second, was basically saying we need a decentralized education system and kids are just getting hammered. But it, it made me think, the healthcare system, we need to decentralize that system too, as many of our long-term listeners understand now. I've been hammering on that thing for a long time, and not just to be against conventional medicine and the healthcare system, but look, look face the facts, look at the results we're getting. The top killers in America, we'll start with heart disease. I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but it, we've got to pound this thing home. 600,000 Americans a year dying from heart disease, and our number one treatment for that statins According to JAMA, March of 22, I believe it was, statins get a 0.8% mortality benefit. So when our number one treatment for the number one killer is a less than 1% benefit, we probably need to look for an alternative to that. Our number two killer, cancer, a study from a few years ago showed the five years um, survival. How much of that is impacted by chemotherapy or does chemotherapy contribute to the five-year survival rates of cancer patients? And it was about one to 2%. Um, and we can just go on and on. I interviewed a gentleman recently, don't know if we'll play it before or after this interview airs, but he was talking about the whole psychiatric field, depression and anxiety in particular in a study back in 2006 um, that was completely based on fraud and now it's well known and even the authors of that original study aren't aren't arguing with that but the american association of psychiatrists are still they, they're silent on it so this fraud that 70 percent of patients get better on ssris when it was really three percent and it was statistical gymnastics and the reason i point all this out is for one thing compassion for the people People are sick and they're looking for solutions and the solution is inside of you. So today we're going to talk about solutions for these kids and really all kids, not just kids with ADD, ADHD, um, dyslexia, learning disability of fill in the blank, autism, um, you know, brain health in general. What we're going to talk about today is, going to, is fascinating. So I had a patient introduce me to Dr. Steve. Um, I guess it's been a few months ago now. We've had a few conversations via Zoom. He's He's got some amazing stuff he's going to share today. And I hope to implement this in the clinical setting here at Veritas, but even potentially in a school setting here in Lubbock. So super exciting. Um, real quick, I just want to say everyone's used to me holding this book up, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, Dr. Natasha McBride. See all these words on here? We call them diagnoses depression, schizophrenia, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, autism, dyspraxia. <clears throat> she kind of ignores all those and labels them one thing, a syndrome, but she relates it to the gut. And we know it's well established, the gut health, the microbes in the gut have a huge part to play in our brain health and our serotonin production, dopamine, all the neurotransmitters, there's no doubt about it. Um, what Weston Price found in the 1920s, 1930s in these, or in these uh, ancestral tribes all over the world is no mental health disease and no chronic disease either. And one interesting thing he noted about the brain health, well, that we know now, he noted that vitamin, the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, when the mom doesn't have those and the fetus is developing in a womb that's deficient of fat-soluble vitamins, one of the things that happens is the arch in the mouth doesn't form appropriately appropriately you don't get the wide arch the high jawline all that you don't have enough room in your mouth that's modern food in the womb causes these kids to not even grow structurally the bone structure doesn't grow right so the teeth are crowded the tongue can't go to the roof of the mouth they can't uh, nasal breathe they can't keep their lips shut their mouth breathing now we know that affects the microbiome mouth breathing <laughs> which affects the brain. So there's multiple, multiple things related to this. And the point always is get back to how we used to do things, ancestral living, eating and thinking, and not thinking it's all just you know, our genetics and there's nothing I can do about it. And that pharmaceuticals are the answer. Look where that's gotten us. We're, we get the worst health outcomes of anybody spending the most money doing it. So is there a different way to look at all of this, including looking at the brain, development of the brain, eye coordination touch, touch and that's what dr steve's gonna i'm gonna be quiet now because he's <laughs> dr steve can talk more than i can well you're i don't know about that you're kind of giving my uh, lecture for me here 
Well, then I definitely need to pause. So Dr. Steve Ingersoll, welcome to the show. I, um, I just want you to kind of introduce yourself. I'm not even going to read your bio. Kind of just tell our listeners uh, who you are, where you were, where you came from, how you got to where you are today. Okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, Steve Ingersoll. I'm a, a, a trained as a developmental optometrist. Uh, well, uh, initially, I was a general optometrist, uh, and uh, I uh, started a practice and saw a, a, in a small town, and, you know, I was the, the guy in the you know, the eye guy in the small town and took care of all kinds of patients, uh, mostly geriatric, but uh, kids too. And, uh, and you know, it's funny. Uh, I was the go-to guy for injuries and, you know, all things uh, eyes and vision. And I had a number of, uh, and I was a young practitioner, not particularly uh, good at my craft uh, because I was a rookie. Uh, I just wasn't that you know, I look back at myself now and, and realize uh, what a simpleton I was at the time, really. <laughs> and uh, so I had these moms come to me with their children uh, who they claimed were having vision problems because they were having behavior and attention and learning problems. And I went through my uh, usual routine of examination that I had been taught in optometry school and dismissed them. And uh, told them, nope, it's not vision. It's it's got to be something else. Go away. <laughs> and uh, and you know it's a small town, so these are folks that I knew personally and would run into at the grocery store. And you know, I mean, we were a pretty tight knit little community. Well, then my kids uh, grew up, and my my son had similar problems, and I had noticed just this funny little thing about how he moved his eyes, which I dismissed in my son, as well as all these other kids that I was responsible for. I, I, I just didn't understand the significance of it. But when my child had trouble uh, with attention and he was uh, a little maniac physically and he was not learning to read uh, and he repeated kindergarten and, oh, he's just a boy. Uh, and and, you know, I was uh, at that time, uh, I was the chairman of the hospital board. So I knew all the physicians real well in town and played golf with them. They were my buddies. And, uh, and you know, they didn't know what to do. They, they said, well, just put the kid on Ritalin. Uh, and, you know, I was not comfortable with that. I, I needed to know something about that before I made that decision. And they really couldn't tell me why. Why, why would I put this kid on an amphetamine that mm -hmm. has the same pharmacology as cocaine it blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine uh, in the uh, uh, reticular system. And uh, I, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you know, why would I do that uh, without some understanding? I'm not doing that without some understanding. So off to the regional specialist we went, same story, really didn't understand the specialist that is the go-to referral source in the region couldn't really tell me how this worked and why this worked and what did it actually do. And so, you know, I just wasn't satisfied. And so I began studying the issue and lo and behold, it was a visual issue. And that little eye movement blip, uh, what it was, was when he would converge his eyes, he would do that bilaterally. But when he diverged his eyes, he did it in a segmented fashion. So that was the, the tiny little thing that I noticed. So it's when he was transitioning to looking far away, instead of both eyes moving out simultaneously, they segmented. Hmm. I didn't know what that meant, but I learned what that meant. And it was significant. It's a tiny, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between eye movement error and visual perceptive error. Let me, let me illustrate that. Uh, Dr. Ben, if you could please just put your finger up right in line with the camera and look at your finger. You now see two of me, true? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what's going on. If your eyes are not pointed exactly at the point of interest, the result, the perceptive result of that is double vision. So here's what was happening with my son. 
when he was looking at something up close, he was fine. But when he went to look far away, he had a momentary double vision, then single. So single, double, single. That momentary interruption of accuracy of visual perception blocked his ability to transition from primarily, uh, from distributing his attention primarily to his hands to its replacement developmentally, his vision. At two years old, we're all hyperactive, right? We're marauding through the environment. Our primary sensing tools are our hands. At, at about 32 months, children develop enough movement skill in the, in the finest motor system in the body. And of course, we, we develop our muscular coordination proximal to distal, meaning towards my uh, spine and then outward and from my big muscle groups to smaller muscle groups. And the smallest and most complex muscle groups are eye movement. So they're late in getting really skilled. I have to have perfect eye movement skills in order to make vision match touch. Mm. And that congruity between the two sensations is the gateway to vision replacing touch as the primary explorative strategy. That's what hyperactivity is. Hyperactivity is a failure to transition to visual dominance as a replacement of tactile. Medicating a hyperactive kid keeps him from moving, but he needs movement most of all to develop that congruity. He needs muscular coordination. That's why there's this comorbidity between you know, sort of a little bit of clumsiness and lack of... Uh, spatial perception and of course then that bring comes into the visual cognitive functions of school yeah. you know, the kids that are doing well with written language are you know written language uh, text you cannot touch it and it doesn't make sound if you don't approach written language with your attention primarily at visual sensation you're in trouble yeah, that's so, precisely the story of uh, the learning disabilities, and we'll get more specific about that. But that's what's going on here. Yeah, well, that, that's a great I intro to what we're going to be talking about. And guys, this is so much deeper than just oh, this hand-eye coordination thing, vision. Can I see stuff? Do I have a little it's double vision for a split second? Have I changed from touching everything as a baby to because it, it's a deeper connection with the actual learning centers in the brain. Right. And so when you're delayed or off and not matched appropriately in this, it's actually impacting these other pathways in the brain of learning. And so, boom, you're not learning. You get labeled something, then you get medicated or you get whatever. But you got to go back and reconnect these pathways because it's way, way deeper than just, oh, I can't see or touch something the right way. So, Dr. C, back to you. Um, maybe kind of explain some of that. If they stay disconnected, I mean, can they eventually kind of catch this thing up when they're 10, 12, 15, 20 years old, or is it always off a little bit? Or 40. <laughs> or 40, yeah. Yes, yes. We now know that we're completely plastic. In other words, we grow our equipment, mm -hmm. our, our neural equipment. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, I lift weights with my right arm, but I completely neglect my left arm. Well, my, le my right arm gets Popeye-ish and, and my left arm, arm is, is atrophied. Yep. That's true in the brain. Uh, we grow our neural pathways by what we do. That is to say, where we send our attention. It's not, it's not so much on the way in, it's on the way out that is the key. It is, before we do anything, we think, I'll give you a little parable here that will illustrate the point. My wife goes to the store and she's going to get 12 items. Before she gets out of the car, she has completed this task. She knows precisely where everything is in this very complicated environment. And she moves through with perfect efficiency and grabs the items with no wasted energy. And she's in and out in no time, and she's perfectly efficient. The next day, she sends me to the store with a list. 
I have no prevision of what I'm going to do. I don't know where this stuff is. And so I'm constantly kind of rechecking my list and wandering around the store trying to find these things. And I'm way more susceptible to distraction because her behavior is governed by the internal vision and uh, confidence of knowing where she, what her plan is. I'm rather aimless. I'm way more susceptible to distraction. In fact, I'm handling things that aren't on the list, looking at, hey, well, this kitchen gadget, we might need this. Uh, and, you know, uh, or the candy on the end, uh, end of the aisles or whatnot. So I'm all over the place. And so I end up coming home uh, way uh, late. I've, uh, I have 15 items in the basket, you know, instead of 12, because I picked up some other stuff that I thought might be appropriate. And I've got the wrong sizes, the wrong brands, and I spent too much money. And so I try to explain to my wife, I have this condition, this attention condition, this attention deficit in stores, uh, but she doesn't buy it. Uh, she, she's an awfully nice lady, so she gives me a pass. But uh, <laughs> I don't really have a condition. I have a lack mm -hmm. of plan. I have a lack of visually directed plan. That's my problem. Attention yeah. deficit is not a... One does not have attention deficit. One does attention deficit. Yeah, it's and there's a, there's a reason and a root cause to that. There is. So, so and back it's of it's a lack of this this creative experience. This this amazing tool that God gave us that is the reason. Uh, well, we were made in God's image, and what does that really mean? It means that we can see through time and space. It's the only reason we're here. I mean, we would we should be dead. We can't run very well. We're, we don't have claws. We can't fly. We barely swim. Uh, we should be extinct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just simply can't compete with the animals on this planet, except for right. one thing. We defeat them all because we have this one tool we know where they're going to be. We can see through time and space with this miraculous skill of creating imagery in our minds. It is the vehicle by which we transcend time and space. It is the human tool. And it is the central piece to all things educational. When I point mm -hmm. my eyes at a book, I'm creating imagery. And that's about the only thing I remember from the experience as a good reader. Mm. Now look at the poor reader. What is that kid doing? If you ask a poor reader, uh, what's the hard part of reading? The kid will always say the same thing. Words are the answer. <laughs> I don't like words uh, is really the story. Because it, let, let's say I went in, uh, Ben, you're the uh, principal of a school and I come into try to solve your reading, your, your main educational problem is reading, right? Uh, and so I say, bring me your 100 worst readers, and I observe them. What do I see? I see a whole bunch of poor attempts at phonologic decoding. Now bring me your best readers. What do I see in those kids? No decoding. So why on earth is our primary strategy of teaching remedial reading or emergent reading to copy the prime characteristics of the worst readers among us. It's mm -hmm. incorrect. Mm -hmm. You, as a good reader, do not phonologically decode words ever. If an extraordinary event occurs and you encounter a word that you don't visually recognize, you skip it. And if your stream of imagery continues, you're home free. And in, in fact, if we look carefully, uh, we have technology that we can track uh, fixations. That is how you point your eyes during reading. There's really just three types of readers. Uh, the type one reader is what you and I do. We actually create predictive imagery first, and then we use our eyes to confirm the imagery. And we make brief confirmatory glances at only some words. 
on the page. If you count up the number of fixations, the number of times we stop during reading, you and I, it's about a third of the words. And which words do you think those would be? I can tell you they're not the, what, and, and but. <laughs> they're the nouns, of course, and a few verbs. That's exactly what we see when we track eye movement among good readers. They only glance for a very brief period of time at keywords because they've already predicted through imagery what the stream of information is going to be. Then there's the type 2 reader, and we notice that they point their eyes at every single word. And they are engaged at looking at the textual word and then converting it into speech. And then they listen to the speaker and from there create imagery. There's a lot of readers like that. Uh, they're slow, their comprehension is interrupted by this translation between you know, visual text and spoken word. So their fixation length of time of fixation on each word is a little longer because of that. I mean, they're successful readers, but they're kind of slow and they really labor at it. And then there's the unfortunate type three reader. And when we look at their eye movement, we see what they're doing. They are pointing their eyes multiple times per word. They're looking at syllables because what they're doing is phonologically decoding. They're looking at the sound units within words. And they have sacrificed, that eats all of their working memory and they don't create any imagery. And of course, those are the disabled readers. Now, why does that happen? Uh, first of all, we need to make that diagnosis. Uh, if we've got poor reading, just practicing reading is a probably, if you've got an unsuccessful reader, practicing reading probably does them harm. It's like me on the golf course. I've got this bad golf swing. So I get 100 balls and hit them all with my bad swing. <laughs> <laughs> Just reinforce that horrible slice. Precisely right. So <laughs> when kids struggle. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when kids struggle at school, we should stop. Don't just practice without knowing yeah. what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, take, for example, uh, math. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask a little kid, uh, okay, what's seven plus six? And the kid pauses and he gets the answer. So then I say, okay, how do you know? And they'll tell me the answer. And usually it's something like uh, seven plus seven is 14, therefore, or seven, six plus six is 12, one more is 13. So then I ask the next question. Okay, if 6 plus 6 is 12 and 7 plus 6 is 13, which one is easier? And the kid says 6 plus 6. I say, well, how do you know what 6 plus 6 is? And they don't know. And I say, oh, so there's some kind of mysterious way that you know 6 plus 6 that you're unaware of. But you know exactly how you know 7 plus 6. Wouldn't it be nice if they were all like that mysterious 6 plus 6? Wouldn't you be better off in math? If we could, if we understood what you were doing for six plus six and they were all that way, wouldn't you be better at math? And mm -hmm. of course the answer is yes. And, mm -hmm. and the, the way the kid knows six plus six is he has it identically. He sees it and recognize, he recognizes the equation six plus six equals 12 in the same way he recognizes a chair. He mm -hmm. does not decode the chair. He doesn't say, hmm has legs and a seat and a back. Oh, it's a chair. <laughs> no. You visually, identically, uh, identically means like photographic memory, uh, remembers it or recognizes it. He recognizes the pattern. And that's the central skill of written language, mathematics, or uh, textual language. Yeah. And nobody gets that. That's critical. <clears throat> and this and critical... It's Go a, ahead brain development thing that we need to understand. So really education needs to be built around the honing and development of this most precious of human tools, mm -hmm. the ability to see with our minds. It's not our yeah. eyes. It's yeah. our mind sight that we're interested in. And what you just have explained in these last many minutes 
is what you are saying in your child that you saw that vision thing was off. That's the clue that, whoa, this, the way to create this image to learn this way for, for math and, and reading for everything, because it, the he, problems right there, we can identify that thing, then reconnect that pathway and boom, you can start, you can become the type one reader instead of this type three reader. That's right. And it's not yeah. just reading, uh, you know, all of a sudden, when I when I understood what the problem was, and I and I learned this from some of my colleagues and some people in other fields than mine, so I kind of put it together with help of many more seasoned practitioners. Who, uh, you know, I mean, I was a dunce really, uh, and and I had to go think of this. Now I'm in a small town. I had turned all these kids away. I finally learned what the story was for my own child. Okay, what am I going to do now? Uh, I'm I'm on the phone to these moms, admitting that they have an idiot for an eye doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and Confession is a first step. So you yeah. Confess and then repent and turn. Go the other way. Right. So right. You're a you're an amazing man because a lot of doctors won't do that. Well, I, I had no choice. I I uh, you know it's not that I'm a great guy. Uh, you know I I saw these ladies in the in the grocery store every day. So I. I had to do it <laughs> and I, and I wanted to do it. I, I needed to do it. And, and so I did, and it changed my life. It changed my whole professional career. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had created a pretty strong general practice. Yeah. And I had hired a couple of uh, colleagues that uh, worked with me and we were, you know, moving along in the usual uh, general practice way and mostly geriatric, you know, and eyeglasses and contact lenses and whatnot, you know, and uh, but I got so interested in this field that uh, pretty soon uh, I had built a new office and I had a whole floor that was unused. Well, I turned that into a learning clinic. Uh, and so I was uh, upstairs working with the kids all the time and, you know, getting behind schedule on the on the general patients. And pretty soon I just said, I don't want any more general patients. <laughs> So that just changed, it changed my career entirely. So yeah. once vision, uh, once vision of the mind, uh, we take it so for granted, but you, you think about it, everything you do is done twice. First in your mind, in a visual image of what you're going to do, and then you carry it out with physicality. Mm -hmm. It's the precursor that it, that's the real skill. Yeah, you know, uh, Wayne Gretzky uh, uh, skates to where the puck will be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I mean, that's the story, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and so hyperactivity goes away yeah. because the, it, it's too much energy expended, needlessly. Yeah. So his vision uh, became his primary explorer to, to uh, replacing his hands. Mm -hmm. It's instantaneous. Yeah. And now, now we come to thinking. There's two ways that we think consciously. We can speak to ourselves or we can picture to ourselves, image to ourselves. And there's two distinct pathways here. And I, I think we'll, uh, I'll show you some uh, neuroanatomical slides that maybe will pop up in, the, in this, if they can be integrated. But anyway, there's called the ventral stream. You know, vision comes in our eyes, uh, goes through the midbrain at the lateral geniculate nucleus, and some some of our peripheral vision goes up a, a place called the suprachiasmal nucleus and feeds our circadian uh, system and our endocrine system. This mm -hmm. is the other thing I want to tell you about. Uh, and and then there's another pathway that goes up to the conscious or to the frontal lobe, and that is the the uh, superior colliculus, and that runs through our reticular or emotional centers and our autonomic balance, the autonomic nervous system of fight or flight or, or, you know, parasympathetic. And those signals are the uh, connected to this dorsal stream, which is our imagery pathway, not the language pathway. So the language pathway are connected to the cone photoreceptors of our central vision. The imagery pathway is the rod photoreceptors on the retina feeding information in to that imagery uh, it's called the dorsal stream comes up through the uh, parietal lobe to the frontal lobe 
So both those pathways reconnect in the frontal lobe, and that's where we create the imagery or internal speech. Those two things compete with one another for our consciousness, for our attention. Mm -hmm. And kids that have trouble, that like dyslexia, what dyslexia actually is, is a person approaching written language with information processing uh, in verbal sense. In other words, they're thinking in sound when dealing with the sighted aspect of language. See, these kids don't have problems with language as long as it hits their ear and comes out their mouth. Mm -hmm. They have trouble when it hits their eye and comes out their pen. Mm -hmm. And indeed, when the words come out their pen, we can see that they're, we can see they're thinking. They're phonetically inventive in their spelling. They spell because, B-E-K-U-Z, or something such. In other words, they're trying to make sound come out the end of their pencil because they're thinking in sound. It's a strategic error of thought. If mm. we solve that, the same thing with hyperactivity, it's a strategic error of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm thinking visual instead of tactile, I'm not hyperactive. Mm -hmm. yep. Same story with reading, writing, and arithmetic. This, this visual tool, this dorsal string, which is vastly more information and much, much faster. In other words, the imagery function occurs at the speed of light. It's instantaneous. The spoken or language function moves at the speed of sound and is sequential. In other words, let's say I'm going to give a quiz. And the quiz is, uh, for everyone watching this, uh, the quiz is name everything uh, in Dr. Ben's screen. And we're going to quiz. You got, you know, 15 seconds to study. And then we're going to, okay. So the, the way that you would, you could do this two ways. You could start naming the items uh, in the background. Well, we've got a picture of some horses. How many horses are there? Uh, some rocks. Oh, look at those uh, conduit tubes. And there's some, uh, you know, we can name all these things and then try to remember the list of named things. Or alternatively, we could recall the look of the scene. The scene contains all of the parts. If we use the, the imagery based thinking, all of the answers are there instantaneously. And when the, when the quiz comes, uh, how many horses were there? Uh, how many uh, conduit tubes were there? How many bricks? Well, we could start, if we saw it with clarity, we could start counting bricks to get our answer. So my point is, visual information processing is so vastly more efficient. And those of us that have been successful in academics, that's why we use the best tool. It's a strategic difference. It's not an intelligence difference. But there are some developmental issues here because vision is peculiar. It's the only sensory system that requires this accuracy to gain perceptive accuracy. I have to make, I have to be physically coordinated in eye movement to get accurate vision, which is the gateway to visual thought. Okay. Now you can start to see why we're seeing this epidemic of failure in these psychoeducational diagnoses that end in, in calling them these things. It's movement. Kids are not moving. It's, mm. it's screens. Kids don't play outdoors with abandon anymore. Mm -hmm. They're playing on two-dimensional surfaces, robbing them of physical play, which is the necessary ingredient to developing accuracy, motor accuracy, muscle coordination accuracy in eye movement that is the gateway to visual dominance in the thinking pattern. These kids are locked into auditory instead of visual thought because their motor uh, development is delayed. Nobody mm. gets that. No one knows that. Mm. It's not an educational or a, a genetic or, uh, you know, it, it, it's not intelligence. It's lack of movement. Wow. And it's a developmental issue. Yep. Uh, and, and that's the story here. And it's easily solved. Yeah. And, and so uh, once I started doing this, 
Uh, so a couple of my colleagues and I decided to disseminate some uh, models, uh, some learning clinics around uh, the state of Michigan. We did that and it, they were very successful. Uh, so we sort of married the uh, neuroscience with education and and uh, uh, education, psychology, neuroscience. It's, it's a multidisciplinary approach, really, to these problems. Uh, and lots of physical movement. So then we had uh, occupational therapists and physical therapists and, uh, you know, all the movement kind of uh, uh, instructors and people. So we had this multidisciplinary group that we got together and the kids were doing so much better that school districts started contacting me and going you know what are you doing here this these kids that are you know were special ed they're doing so much better what do you what's the magic sauce here <laughs> and so so uh then i started getting uh hired to train school districts uh their staff and did that for a while and then in um the mid 90s in Michigan, they they passed the charter school law. So one of the uh, educational administrators that had hired me to train teachers called me up one day and said, uh, gee, why don't you uh, write up a, a model of what you think schools should look like and we'll submit it to the authorizing university, uh, the universities, public universities were the, uh, were the, the bodies that that uh, entered into contractual arrangements that formed charter schools. So I wrote this paper and we submitted it and they said, hey, good idea. Sounds great. Boom, I'm in the school business. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, we'll start a school. So, you know, we uh, uh, we didn't know anything about starting schools, really, other than we knew all about child development and how they become, you know, what, what's the difference between successful kids and unsuccessful kids? And the answer is unsuccessful kids. It's not that they're not as good at the things that the successful kids are doing. They're not doing the same thing. In other words, the successful kids are doing it right, the easy way. And the unsuccessful kids, it's not that they're just not good at this. They're not doing the same thing. And nobody gets that. No, we just need to train them first we got to get rid of the developmental obstacles which are usually eye movement anomalies you know little blips in eye movement which are easy to solve you know so we solve those get those obstacles out of the way and then reteach them to think that is to say learn in the same way that the rest of us do and boom problem goes away they don't have a condition they lack skills and they're executing a bad strategy yeah simple it's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I did this. And, uh, and of course, what happened was the initial school, the first school we did, uh, you can imagine what type of population we attracted. We had a, a new school and, and we trained the teachers who were coming out of teacher college. They had no idea what I was even talking about because <laughs> uh, <and laughs> they'd never heard anything like this, you know, yeah. and, and, and of course, the, the initial population of kids were all special ed kids, uh, mostly, you know, maniacs, physical maniacs. <laughs> yeah. so these kids are just, you know, all over the place. They're escaping out the door, running for the highway, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're just in chaos. The first uh, and, and, and the, uh, the state test scores were done in the fall at that uh, back in those days. And so we took uh, our kids took and we were dead last, dead last by far. You know, we had a, a, a building of 200 kids, completely rookie teachers. And, you know, we, we we were doing well to keep them from, you know, harming each other. <laughs> and so I took my clinical staff and I said, OK, we're, we're closing down these clinics or at least we're cutting them back to half. And you guys are going to go in and save this school. So that's what we did is we took up my clinical staff and came in and then we started building the, the uh, culture up so that people knew what to do. And, uh, and it was working pretty well. And by the mid year, by January of that first year, uh, things were settling down. The place was starting to run uh, well. And 
and we had a whole waiting list of uh, people that wanted to come in. So we thought, well, okay, let's expand the school. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden we uh, got a whole bunch of new kids, uh, you know, disturbing the whole culture. And, uh, and of course, we hired some new teachers that didn't know what they were doing. And back into chaos we went. <laughs> but by the end of the year, we were doing well, very well. Uh, so much so that the authorizing university uh, invited us to start another school. And pretty soon we had eight schools. And then we, we had the, the authorizers came to us with uh, late, in later years and said, well, we've got this school over here that's failing. Would you guys take it over? So we started taking over schools. So anyway, we did uh, all these schools and they, they, uh, the state did a study of uh, all school models across the state. And they measured the uh, percentage of students uh, that met proficiency levels in reading and math uh, and compared them uh, across all school models. And it was a four-year study. Uh, Michigan State University conducted the study for the uh, Michigan Department of Education. And it wasn't even close. We just blew everybody away. Uh, wow. it, it was the spread on the bar graphs was like this, you know, I mean, no one was even close. Mm -hmm. So then the governor called me and, and uh, called me into his office and said, Hey, uh, you've got something going here. Uh, why don't we disseminate your model down the I-75 corridor, which is kind of Saginaw, Flint, Pontiac, Detroit, you know, the worst school districts in the state. So also happened to be, uh, you know, the Democrat strongholds uh, in Michigan. And uh, so I said, great. Uh, you know, when the governor calls you in and says, how would you like to? You say, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what we did. We started building these schools out. And all of a sudden, well, first we, we had, uh, all along the way, we had these little dirty tricks that would happen. Like our kids would compete at the track meet and, and they would, just not call out our, you know, we have a kid that's finished third or something and they would go and announce on the, uh, these are in pu general public schools and our kids competing with them. They would say first place, uh, so-and-so school, second place and fourth place. And they just not announce us, you know, and it's it was like it was little dirty tricks like that, you know, yeah. and uh, we would hire, I uh, remember there were our kindergartners were going to go on a field trip and we, uh, contracted with the public school bus to take them and the kids are all lined up. They're going to go to the Dow gardens over in Midland and, uh, everyone's all excited. Moms are chaperoning and the bus doesn't show up. So, you know, we have to scramble and go get a private, you know, just things like that. One time over a weekend, one of our schools was broken into and, uh, uh, there was vandalism and they released rats. Uh, someone mm -hmm. in there and released a bunch of rats in the school and it just, just dirty tricks. But then it, it, when we uh, were executing this plan for this major expansion down the I-75 corridor, then it really got nasty. Uh, and uh, we were attacked by, uh, well, I don't even, I don't know how much we want to go into these terrible things that happened, but well, SWAT team uh, came uh, and, and alleged uh, asbestos mishandling in our schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a nasty mess uh, of corruption. Yeah, um, and that, that's what I do want to point out because when, no matter what we're talking about, this, the psychiatric journals I, I mentioned at the top of the show, you know, these statins that are 0.8% benefit. I mean, people just say, how can this happen? And, and you're telling this amazing story. We're 44 minutes into this thing. And it's just like, this is incredible. Like every school, every kid that's out there struggling and labeled and, and the governor notices we have hard data studied over four years, published data, irrefutable governor notices it. And, and, and then all of a sudden we get, wait a minute, democratic stronghold. Whoa, that's out of the, we're yep. talking politics now. Well, unfortunately, yeah. Because yeah. why? Because there's money, 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 money. Why is American Psychiatric Journal? Why statin? Why, why is chemo only getting a one percent benefit, but we're sticking with it, not looking outside the box to alter the root of all evil, the love of money. Yeah. 
Yep, that's so, what so was, let's talk about this education just a little bit. Education, how does teachers unions, just all that stuff, charter schools, there's a millions and millions and millions of dollars on the line. I believe in a previous conversation you mentioned with this, when the governor said, hey, let's go down the I-75 corridor, let's take some of these schools. Can you basically go save these schools? We're talking millions and millions of dollars, right, on the line? Yeah, we were. These schools had, uh, had done eight schools uh, in Michigan, and one of my colleagues started a couple schools out in California on the same model, and we, we helped them get those uh, started. But, uh, you know, the budget, the annual budget of each of these schools, $10 million. So there's a lot of money here. And I was so naive. I, you know, uh, that's a lot of money uh, going out of the coffers of the school district that where we resided in each of these schools. So I, I understood that there would be opposition, but I was just totally naive. I mean, I had no idea they actually came with guns. They came with SWAT teams predicated on the, uh, the, the, the tip or the, the justification for the warrant that authorized these SWAT team raids on two of my, a simultaneous SWAT team raids on two of my elementary schools. Uh, the, the justification for that was that we had mishandled some asbestos in the reconstruction of these buildings which was completed a year before. And that justifies a SWAT team coming in a week before school is to open and herding all the teachers out. I mean, clearly, the, you know, it was just absurd. And uh, that's what they did. And of course, that was back, uh, you know, 10 years ago before. Now we see it as commonplace. You know, they're doing this. They're exercising political power to protect the financial structure of uh of public schools public schools are failing they're failing across the board we know that in in performance and in culture and in everything in every way that you can think of they're dangerous yeah uh, I, I don't want to you know what i want to emphasize is that we know what to do and we've demonstrated it at scale we know how to fix this problem yeah we know how to help and it's not that hard. I'm yep. arguing for decentralization of schooling. Yep. Parents need to be in control. And I think we should be putting, I think every church should have its own school. And it's perfectly doable. I could start a school in a church in my sleep. <laughs> I've done this. I know that it's doable. Yep. Any reasonable adult with a good heart and some energy can learn to do a better job than what's happening in schools today. Yeah. And a much better job. Oh and, yeah. And so, and of course the culture, the, I mean, the little motto of our school program is safe, loved dot, dot, dot learning. If you don't get those first two things, right. You don't get to do the dots, which are the science of learning. Mm. You don't even get there. You got to get, those kids have to be safe. And when I say safe, I mean physically, of course, but also culturally. And they have to be loved. And if you don't get those two right, you're done. You should yep. not have those children. Yep. Then there's this good, solid science. And that's what leads to the learning, the effectiveness in learning. Yeah. It just naturally, it's a natural byproduct of those those first two. And then, yeah, throw in the knowledge that I believe Holy Spirit's led you in. And what really what you're describing, Steve, in my opinion, I mean, we've had guys in the agricultural uh, industry because the, our ag system is failing. The soil is absolutely depleted of anything nourishing so therefore our food is to our healthcare system obviously we're dead last it's a failed system spending the most money bankrupting everybody businesses in particular you know trying to in the education i mean so what you're all of these centralized uh functions it's, are it's the world it's the world's model jamie winship on the show a few weeks ago said the in the uh enterprise versus kingdom um yeah. Uh, no empire. Sorry. We're going up against the empire, but it's the world's model and it's rooted in love of money and other things. Well, you know, who's in charge of the, of the world. 
the, uh, the prince of this of the air. You got it. And he's a defeated enemy. So God's raising up. And he's raised up people in the agricultural industry, the healthcare industry, the education industry to put on display himself. I mean, the multifaceted wisdom of God going to be put on display to the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms by the church, which is his body, me, you and others in the kingdom, in the body. I mean, this is it. I've been talking about this for many weeks now in lots of different ways. And here's the education model. It's amazing. You're, you're, right. you're doing amazing. God, obviously, when he knit you together in your mom was won't put this in you. I yeah. mean, I've heard you say a couple of times you were kind of the dunce or the, you know, not that bright and all that, which I understand because I say the same thing about myself. I was middle of the pack in my in my medical school class. I had to work my tail off to just, you know, to get in and to stay in and all that. But it there's something good. about a humbleness in you. And the ability to see the big picture, be led by the Holy Spirit so the truth can come through you. And what you just last said about be safe, feel protected and, and, and covered and, and, and then loved. Oh, that's kingdom. That's the kingdom coming into the earth for these kids. And, you know, the stuff that I know uh, is important. Uh, it's it's uh, I'll just say in my field, uh, I'm. I'm recognized as the guy. Okay. I, I, my colleagues know that I'm the go-to guy, but did I do that? Am I the guy that the smartest guy in the room? I am not. This is, this, this was given to, I don't know where it, uh, it wasn't my doing. I'll say mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, I realized this out of the blue, mm -hmm. uh, not out of the blue. I mean, I, I needed to learn from for my son's sake, and then I became excited about it, and then it just it just the realizations, the connections of how this fits together, and the science they just came together almost by themselves. I mean, I know where it came from. It's not me. Yeah, I yeah. am. I am a mission driven person at this point, <laughs> not because I'm righteous <laughs> or uh, have set out to be that way i'm a pawn being led and yeah. i'm smart enough to realize that <laughs> yeah so okay that's the way it is uh, yeah. okay I, yeah. i'm i'm there i'll do what makes sense uh to god uh let's just be honest about it i'm not this is not me i mean yeah. I'll, I'll do everything i'm supposed to do to the best of my ability but i know that it's not uh I'm not the super intellect here. Right. Sure. Well, same here. Trying to be a vessel, um, trying to be obedient to what the Lord's drawing and leading us in. We've got just a few minutes left, five, six minutes left, Steve. I mean, I know listeners are going to react to this very positively. Some are going to want to, how do I sign up? They're going to want to contact you. I know here locally in Lubbock, we've been talking with Steve about getting something going here. We're at the very beginning, kind of still talking through, but getting more serious in our talks. So I do want to kind of just for the local folks, if this is resonating with you, um, I know we're going to need um, moms for sure and kids. We're going to need some help from an, a therapy or instruction level, and there's different things. So you can contact us if you're here locally and interested. Info at veritasmedical.com is the email. That would be the best place. Just put subject line uh school or, or Steve Ingersoll or something. And, and we'll talk through that. We'll have an informational meeting. We'll have more discussion, but Steve, for those, we have listeners all over the country and outside the country. What's the best way to learn more? We'll probably need to have you back on here to get more into the science maybe and get those slides and really for those who are really interested in, and how does this actually look in the day-to-day -day school model? What's my kid going to actually be doing? What's the time commitment? What's financial commitment? What's all this stuff? What's it look like? So part two, we'll, we'll probably have to do soon, but um, in the few minutes we have left, the way to contact you, the way to learn more and, and what are, um, even for us, kind of the next steps as far as personnel that we want, might want to recruit or attract to an informational meeting. Yeah. What, what I, my vision of this and the way we've done this in other locales is we really need a, a marriage between a clinic and a school. Uh, and so, and the school grows naturally out of a learning clinic and a medical clinic. So the medical based clinic is uh, to develop those neurologic skills that put the child into a learning 
mode, a visual learning mode. And then an educational program or learning clinic is to teach them how to learn. And that naturally then grows into a school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are the kind of the three educational arms of this. Now, this medical clinic has other applications, brain injury, geriatrics, uh, and the various psychoeducational diagnoses, and specialty groups like autistic children. Aut autism is also a series of maladaptive behaviors. It's not a condition. One doesn't have autism, one does autism. The question is, why do they do those strange things? That's mm -hmm. a lecture unto itself. Uh, yeah. we, should, if we don't have time to dive into that, but that's something, uh, autism, as you know, is exploding. And the reason it's exploding is developmental. So we need a whole lengthy discussion on that. Yeah. The whole training program. So I think what we need to do is, uh, well, certainly train. It's training. That's what needs to happen. And for more information, uh, we have a nationally, uh, I have a bunch of multidisciplinary uh, network of providers that know what, uh, that are working with me on these things. Uh, and uh, the, the best way to get information on that is Iconix, and that's I-C-O-N-I-X, IconixLearningClinic.com. Okay. So that's the, awesome. uh, just go to that website, and then there's a whole bunch of information and some contact information to talk to some of the folks at, uh, uh, for more information. And, awesome. And, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, uh, certainly uh, interested in cultivating uh, relationships with the professionals and with parents in need and of course teachers and educators and people that are interested in helping kids that are struggling and uh, yep. and I'd like to I, I'd like to get uh, and I've been working with uh, Cassidy and your and your staff uh, and uh, and we've been working up some ideas on how to how to project uh, into your area and we'll be able to do that uh, it, it really is just information uh, because mm -hmm. the the actual people are people have the ability to do these things to understand what's happening and meet the challenge of what needs to be done uh, without a great deal of uh, medical background they can do this yeah it's nice to have the medical work, and that is a good ongoing training thing, but you can do effective instruction and work with these kids with six weeks of training. Yeah. And we could have a, a clinic, a learning clinic up and running in your locale in six weeks time, doing mm -hmm. effective work to help those kids learn how to learn. And it's fun. <clears throat> uh, as it should be. The, the greatest pedagogy of all time is play. Uh, kids learn more. You know, if you do the, uh, if you look at the literature on synaptic density, between three and five years old is the greatest learning period of all of human development. Hmm. And, the, and the pedagogy, the methodology of building that enormously rich learning time is play. I'm glad you mentioned that because and, a big when school starts, the synaptic density starts pruning. It starts moving the other direction. <laughs> well, if we had any sense about us, we would extend down. the period of play into school. Yep. That's yep. Exactly what we've done with our model. Our and just model, little little teaser for the future is uh, play. This model is a lot of playing. We we say. Uh, Teachers must learn to play so that children can play to learn. Mm, yeah. So we teach teachers how to play in strategic ways with yeah. kids, with kids, not uh, supervise their play, but play with them. Yeah. And kids love that because the two biggest things that teachers, the two things that make teachers not sleep at night and make them want to quit their job is lesson planning and lack of engagement. Mm. And those two things are solved with the iconics uh, learning model because it's all play. Yeah. The kids like to play. 
Yep. Well, let's, yep. we're going to have to end, end it there, Steve. Um, but I, that's a good place to leave it because the thought of playing, it, extending that three to five year old window and continue to play, but you're learning. And I do want to say this, we've been talking about dyslexia and um, poor readers and all that, but all kids, I mean, you, this can be a school for all children to sure. continue to learn properly and to make the top scores. I mean, what he was talking about earlier, these charter schools and, and when he was first starting out, all these kids, like he said, just to keep them from hurting each other and keeping them sort of in the building and scoring by far the worst to by far the best in a short years, window of time. Years. took us three years to be the top scoring school in the region. And we repeated yep. that eight times. That's what attracted the governor's attention. We went from last to first. Every school that we started started out last and ended up first. Attracted the governor's attention and attracted the big money people who wanted yes. to keep the big money to themselves. But yes. we're going to have to have you back, Steve. For those interested, info at veritasmedical.com. Send us an email. Cassie Luna is our pediatrician here on staff that's really working with Steve a lot as well as myself. We're kind of getting our team put together right now. It's in the beginning stages. We don't have solid, solid stuff, but we're moving quickly in that direction. So reach out if you're interested or, or especially if you have a kiddo who you think would benefit. I'm sure we'll have an informational meeting soon. Uh, we'll put that out in our newsletter and on the website. Dr. Steve, thank you so much for coming. We'll have you again for part two, three, and four, I'm sure. So thank, thank you so much for all you're doing for these kids and for spreading this message of truth and for being who God made you to be. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, and uh, I, I uh, appreciate the time that you spent with me. Well, it's our pleasure and our honor. Thank you. All right, everybody. We'll be back next week with another great show. I'm Dr. Ben Edwards. You're the cure. See you next time.